and welcome to Insight. I am Elizabeth Omori. The 2023 United Nations Food System stock-taking moment, which took place in Rome, Italy, provided a platform for nations to commit to transforming their food systems for sufficiency. At the summit, Nigeria's Vice President announced that Nigeria mobilized half a billion dollars to advance innovation financing for food system transformation develop agro-value chain and special agro-industrial processing zones programs. How will this transform to food on the tables of Nigerians? A focus on Insight today. A new report by the International Renewable Energy Agency says nearly 60% of Nigeria's energy demand in 2050 can be met with renewable energy sources saving 40% in natural gas and 65% in oil nets at the same time. With the growing population and socio-economic challenges, Nigeria needs maintainable energy sources to meet the growing needs of the population and businesses. In 2022, renewable energy accounted for 16.4% of the total electricity capacity in Nigeria. Currently, the on-grid Energy mix in Nigeria is dominated by thermal, 80% in hydro, 20% power generating sources. Today, we will analyze the nation's energy mix towards effective electrification. So, welcome to Insights. I'm fascinated with the discourse on national monuments and assets and how much is being done to preserve and Look into the language energy. issue. We have turned English to become like a pride value in our own cultural values. No cash transfer is not a COVID-19. Version 1897 was a deliberate, deliberate tactic. You know, many of these people attempt. coming to the urban areas now. These and applications, um, there are terms and conditions. That of course, mean, um, it is yes. the union of uh, two people, a man and a woman coming together. My name is Nam Diodipo. And I'm Elizabeth. Omori. and stakeholders to proactively tackle these challenges. We know. Women in most countries of the world constitute about 50% of registered voters. Henry Williams reporting for Dateline 360. In Jaws, Caleb Gochin, Deadline 360. Naja Deadline 360. Shidi Okrafo. For Deadline 360. In Lagos, Michael Olaleye. Reporting for Deadline 360. I am Omosola Omojola. Thanks for tuning in. A full-scale Africa-led agri-food systems transformation would not be possible without game-changing solutions, greater investments in smallholder farmers, embracing new technology and new partnerships at all levels, as some of the recommendations made at the just-concluded UN Food Systems Summit in Rome, Italy. Sustainable investments to build food sovereignty in Africa and the need for strengthening domestic resources, investing in climate action and fixing the global financial architecture are also some of the resolutions reached at the summit. In a world of plenty, why do we still suffer food shortage? My guest, Professor Mohamed Yahya Kuta, agriculture extension expert from the University of Ibadan, will answer this question and also analyze the resolutions reached at the summit. Prof, thank you for joining us on Insights. Nice to join you here. So why are we having food shortage in Africa? Let's begin with that question. Well, the truth is that the population growth in Africa is not commensurate to food growth. And where you have that imbalance, there is a tendency that you are going to suffer shortages. In addition, climate change is a reality. 
we are battling with faster rate of desert encroachment at six kilometer per annum. That is massive. And there's nothing deliberate done to halt this encroachment. We are also dealing with flood as a result of changes in the timing and quantum of water at a particular time during the rains. And we are not prepared in adopting technologies for water harvesting where you harvest excess water during the rain season and apply it during the dry season for dry season agriculture. Mm. In addition, the rate of rural urban migration is at an alarming rate, especially in new democracies in Africa. In other climes, technology is now driving the world. Investment in information communication technology age has taken young people to the global zenith of excellence, especially in countries where investment in education has taken a serious toll. When agriculture in African continents, as the revolution passed, is major, majorly in the hands of smallholder farmers. And these smallholder farmers, they are so disadvantaged in terms of access to information on latest technology in agriculture, particularly improved seeds that could increase their yield per actor, and indeed the other agrochemicals that they need to enhance their production base in terms of fertilizers, pest control uh, chemicals, and others that are not harmful to both humans and animals in that environment. Okay, Prof, we are also I, I, dealing Prof, with. I, I need to come there. Yes. I'm happy you mentioned smallholder farmers. What will be your take on the resolutions at the summit for food sufficiency? Well, the opportunity in every in every challenge, there is always an opportunity. We could trans transform the current challenges to opportunities where we could enhance agricultural productivity along the entire value chain. We cannot continue to concentrate on production, 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 and at the end of the day, the producers will be left with their produce without value addition, without opportunity, without technology for preservation, and wastages continue. So we, we are very much aware that investment in the entire agricultural value chain is only way out of the current quagmire. And Nigeria, as a case study, is to deliberately look into that aspect so that we can enhance our production and at the same time have opportunity for value addition so that our products shall not just be cutted away. So Nigeria, as a necessity, must key into the value chain development in agriculture by looking at all the parameters of production that we can get technology, I mean, improved uh, seeds that can yield better per hectare. I always give example, any opportunity that I have to look at what is happening to NCRI Badegi that is in the enclave of the largest rice producing state in Nigeria, Niger State. Mm -hmm. In NCRI Badegi, they, they, they have produced the cultivars that have been helping Nigerian agricultural production system, particularly Faro 44 and Faro 54. And now they have come up with another cultivar that can yield higher from 1.5 hectares to 5, I mean 5 tons per hectare, 1.5 tons per hectare to 5 tons per hectare. With this yield potential, that means farmers within the production or agroecological zone Whereas production is, is uh, high, that means farmers will smile home. Of course. Therefore, I will implore the possibility and probability of looking for investment more on research so that research will take the center stage in our agricultural enterprise. So that investment in research will yield more uh, you know, high yielding disease resistant products that can put smile on the face of the producers and then from there, we migrate to technologies that can preserve some of these products beyond the shelf life. The wastages that happen when farmers transport their tomato from Kano to Lagos, 80% or 70% with all modesty get 
wasted before mm -hmm. they get to the end user. And therefore, at the end of the day, the farmers don't maximize their potentials in type Absolutely. of pricing. But if we're able to generate a value addition whereby some of these products can be converted to products that can stand shelf life, and we have seen good examples happening where uh, a value addition to products like ginger, like cismen, and uh, a very good example, I saw one in the diaspora exhibition recently where business visa brought products from all over the world. And one of the participants, I mean, to showcase to the world, to the diaspora, and one of the participants lamented that how could Nigeria be producing more quality products refined and with value addition like this? Meanwhile, in America and other Europe countries, they don't see them. What they see is from Ghana with low production, I mean, with low value addition and uh, compared to what we have in Nigeria, that they are surprised they're not seeing these products on Amazon. So there is a window of opportunity that we can mass produce and add value and even export. But in the interim, we need to deal with our domestic production, I mean, consumption requirement. Nigeria can feed herself. We have the potentials. I can always boast that Niger State alone has the potential to feed the whole of West Africa because the Fadamad floodplain from Kainji, where you have you know, Kainji Dam, down to the Jeba, down to Muregi, down to Mue, up to the confluence of the River Niger and Benue in Lokoja. The entire floodplain is more, 10 times more than what you have in Thailand. And unfortunately, Thailand, because of their adoption of improved technologies and including, I, I mean, uh, mechanization, is already was, was the largest exporter of rice to Nigeria before the, the, the previous government banned importation of rice. So if Nigeria can take the entire Fadama floodplain of River Niger and River Benue, we can feed the whole of West Africa, not only Nigeria. Not but only there Nigeria. we must introduce technology to support the producers who are majorly small-scale producers. There's a community in Doko and a Dojiki in Niger State. If you go to those locations, you will see as far back, as far as five kilometer radius, the only thing you see is rice. And oh. they are majorly produced by small-scale farmers who are on their own. So, and in many climes, where you achieve it, government will come in in terms of supporting them with credit facility, supporting them with tractorization. This time around, we need small, you know, uh, tractor equipment, which I'm very proud to say, Nigeria Agricultural Mechanization Center in Elori, in Elori has done a lot in terms of prototype production of small technology to support agricultural system. But unfortunately, they are battling with escalation and uh, multiplication what they have. My conviction is that government, especially given uh, Bola Ametinibu's government and his antecedents as governor of Lagos State, in the same breath, his vice president, Kasim Shetima, being a product of the University of Ibadan like me, and an agricultural economist by his background, with what he did in Borunu State, can be replicated nationwide so that Nigeria will begin to smile back to food sufficiency. And I will recommend strongly that an emergency situation like this that we have in declaration of food security, emergency of food security, Nigeria has a window of opportunity to replicate what happens to agricultural development in the 80s when the World Bank assisted project, the agricultural development intervention, adopted the extension system, popularly known as training and visit, authored by Dane Beno, an Indian who came to Nigeria and taught us that extension is the nerve center of agricultural revolution. So if you want to make any change, the game changer in this direction is agricultural extension. Prof, talking about support, uh, the Food Summit Vice President Kashim Shatima actually disclosed that Nigeria has mobilized half a billion dollars uh, to for innovative, profitable, and sustainable food systems a transformation initiative. What is your position on this? Well, I, I, I'm one of those who believe that money is a necessity, okay. but it's not the ultimate. It is the commitment of the citizenry and those who are charged with the responsibility that can make the difference. Yes, we may mobilize the resources, but our wish 
those who will be charged with responsibility and the trust to implement will do it religiously and apply these resources so that it will get those who really need these resources to make a difference. Yes, we have different entities to facilitate credit access to farmers, but in reality, do the real farmers access those money? That's so that is the question. question. In, the, in, in, the, in the fund analysis, the entire agricultural value chain is in need of funding support. And those who are charged with responsibility, can they swear to the oath of office that they apply those resources judiciously that it will impact on the populace? Yes, the government can mobilize resources. Great, fantastic. But government must also, of necessity, pay attention to the implementation with a robust monitoring and mechanism, I mean, monitoring and evaluation mechanism to ensure that they apply it judiciously and with absolute transparency and accountability. And that is the hallmark of other claims that have done well. They have implemented those things without fear of contradiction that, I mean, transparency and accountability are the watchword. And I know this country has abundant, excellent human beings that can be deployed to take responsibility and they will do it well without any fear that they will not be found wanting. So I have every conviction that what is happening to some of the World Bank assisted project interventions like the Rural Assets and Agricultural Marketing Project, RAM, that has come on stream that is almost covering the entire about 24 states now. It started with five states. That is the window that some of these resources can be deployed. The opportunity for deploying these resources, the Vice President said, is to quickly reinvigorate and bring back all the moribund agricultural development programs across the 36 states and the FCT. By the time we're able to do that and revitalize the extension system, we can even create an emergency extension window. We are all graduates of agriculture or graduates of related fields who are not employed. We can deploy them and give them emergency step-down training in different locations across Nigeria and unleash them to the agricultural development interventions. Give them logistic support. What they will do to continue to visit the farmers on site, guide them, provide the extension services, especially the new technologies, access to fertilizers, access to credit, access to inputs of production that they will maximize their potential. I'm, tell, I'm sure Nigeria will start exporting rice to many of the neighboring countries in a legitimate way soon, and even some for outside because we're going to have surpluses. And then the value chain will come on stream where Bank of Industry will support those who are into value addition so that they can maximize their potentials. I've seen, you know, Kuli Kuli refined, but the way they refine it like complex that you can import and a snack. And then government can make it mandatory that every office in Nigeria should patronize made in Nigerian product. No crackers from outside. Let's develop our own in indigenous crackers from our own products and eat it and buy it. And Nigeria is going to go into mass production, mass value chain, value addition, and then it's going to, Nigeria is going to be better for it. Okay. Now, talking about uh, adding value, the vice president also wooed investors to take advantage of the vast potential uh, in the agribusiness in Nigeria. How do we strengthen stakeholder collaboration? Well, first of all, what the Vice President said in Rome is instructive. Nigeria is indeed the largest country in the African continent. When I listened to the Vice President, he said, out of every four African, one is a Nigerian. And indeed, the potential of Nigeria, given the landmass, Niger State alone has the largest landmass in Nigeria, followed by Borno State, 76,000 square kilometers, 80% arable, with abundant body of water resources that can be deployed for irrigation farming. I normally will cite the example of Tunga Kao Irrigation Project in Wushishi in Niger State. This is a community where you have an irrigation project, dam, that has the capacity to support 10,000 farmers. But at the last count, less than 30% of that potential has been utilized because of lack of the support system that can ginger the farmers to produce more. But the prosperity in that community is legendary. 
The rice production in that community is three times a year. They will produce the rain-fed one natural, and then immediately after the rain-fed agriculture, they will, the, the stock of rice that is left will on its own sprout out and produce another level of rice again. Farmers will in three months come and avail that one second. Then immediately the dry season is set in, they will clear the entire farm again and go into dry season farming using the irrigation water. So if every community with irrigation potential like this, like Tigadam in Kanu and uh, Adeja Jemari River B the Development in Jigawa, can adopt this type of production cycle, you know that the issue of food security will be a thing of the past. And that is just one or two, three examples. There are, Ondo, in Ondo, say you have the Owena River Basin, you have the Ogun River Basin. So there are so many river basins that can support agricultural production like that. And it will make sure, um, guarantee our production base and enhance the quality and quantity of production that is coming out of those locations. And indeed, if value addition with the small technologies for processing that are available now at the grassroots level, that will enhance production that will be the game changer in our agricultural system. And I'm confident this is where the agribusiness component will come in. Okay. Because right from... The president of the African Development Bank, when he was Minister of Agriculture in Nigeria, he said to us that, look, if we must look at agriculture as a business, not as an occupation alone, for occupation is the largest employer of labor in Nigeria, 70%. Any sector that can take away young people out of the, the mm -hmm. road, out of the, 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 the street for you, you should quickly grab it Embrace and make it, it. attractive. I witnessed in one of the occasions in IIT the Baden, where a medical doctor dropped his status quo and is now an agro entrepreneur, doing excellently well. He's not insulting the status quo, but that he has found life and prosperity in agriculture. And so many young people like that in, 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 in the entire subsector of agriculture, not only crops, including fisheries and aquaculture including livestock and by the way when we're talking about agriculture it's not only about crops we have huge potentials in an area that is untapped livestock i am very sure as swaju bola and a Tinibu administration will unleash these potentials to nigeria so that we can take young men to go into livestock production massively so that we are going to be that will be the game changer of our economic prosperity the idea of nigeria importing an average of 100, 000, I mean 100 billion worth of milk to Nigeria every quarter mm. is unacceptable. We have the potentials to produce milk that will sustain our uh, domestic requirement and even export. But we cannot continue to be a, a food importing nation, nation because it's unacceptable. It's now a business that can be globally attractive to Nigeria. Prof. Uh, you know, the United Nations Sustainable <coughs> Development Goal 2 aims to end hunger and all forms of malnutrition by 2030. How do we commit to achieving this universal goal? I'd like to recall the episode of my encounter with some Malaysian scientists at the uh, Crop Science Society Conference in 2002. The international conference, I challenged them. I said, you came and stole our oil palm in Nigeria, seedlings. And today now you are exporting oil to Nigeria. It's unacceptable. They say, no, point of correction. That they are going to refine it to 1956, when the Research Institute for Oil Palm was established in uh, Benin, NIFO, and their counterpart. Anytime there is any scientific discovery, the scientists from the two institutes will exchange visits, come and see what we have developed. So they did look at what happened in Nigeria and exported our new technology, adapted it to their own agroecological situation, including the deficiency of the bees that pollinate the oil palms, came to Calabar, Cross the river state to 
entomologists to breed and to take some of them, and they adopted them. He said, but that's not the what led to their massive change. He said it was the commitment of government yeah. that brought about the revolution in Malaysia. That the annual budget plan for Malaysia oil palm expansion, if it's in the state that they are going to target 10,000 uh, hectares of expansion, he said the government will clear 100,000 hectares for the farmers annually. Until the entire land available in Malaysia was totally covered by oil palm. Even backyards were taken over by oil palm. If we really want to catch up, there must be some deliberative actions that should be on the top of the agenda. And I will suggest and recommend to the president there should be a presidential you know, tax force on food security that funding support will quickly take hunger out of town. We cannot wait for bureaucracy. We cannot wait for people who will slow down the pace of implementation so that there will be no any ripple effect of hunger in our land. It has happened in many climes where the target is to address the poor of the poorest. And it's tied down to education so that those whose children are poor and are not able to go to school, they will support them so that they can go to school. And the more people go to school, they will be able to possibilitize their lives and indeed create a window where some of them will be either self-employed or will gain gainful employment. So for me, I believe the only of opportunity for Nigeria in meeting up with the MD SDGs goals is to have an introspection. Whatever we're not doing right, we should do them right. Mm. Whatever we're not doing in terms of global best practices, we must be part of the global community. Take the kind of contribution Nigerians are making globally. They are celebrated all over the world for excellence and for professional acumen. So what is wrong in we promoting the best for the best for Nigeria? We can always do that. Allow politics to play its part in terms of engineering of emergence of leaders. But in the, in the service of nation, in the appointment and getting people to participate in the development of our country, the best must be allowed to take its pride of place. Yes. And I'm sure if we do that, we are on the route out of poverty. But not a situation where frustration will even set young people to be on Japan syndrome. All our universities must be encouraged to continue to produce the best brand to be exporting. Mm -hmm. Just like India did. Today, if you count the best global ICT-driven institutions in the world, the leaders are Indians. So I pray that we are going to have functional education as part of our development agenda. All the universities, polytechnics, must be supported with equipment and the remuneration for the people who produce those brains should be enhanced, enhanced. so that they will remain here. Uh -huh. Nigeria is our home, is our country. We have no any other place to be proud of. So if they go, just like the Indians, the highest remittances is from those in the diaspora, Indian diaspora. Uh -huh. And so Nigeria can be the same, whereby you export your best, who will now you know, send back what they have gained, but your home is continuously producing the best. So we cannot kill our institutions that are producing the best. Mm -hmm. We would rather support them so that they will be excellent institutions. Nobody can be part of the future of the 21st century and beyond if you are not ICT compliant. Today, they are not talking about only electronic issues. They are talking about artificial intelligence. How prepared is Nigeria for artificial production of artificial intelligence experts in different fields of human endeavor so that we can be part of the global community? And that can only be achieved through a soundproof educational system. And I believe with the endowment of an average Nigerian, we have all it takes to beat the rest of the world. Yes. But we must be conscious of this and pursue to logical conclusion.
Thank Professor Mohamed Yaya Kota, I want to thank you so much for joining us on Insights. Uh, this session has really been intellectual. Thank you so much for your contributions. Thank you. Thank nice you very much. I'm fascinated with the discourse on national monuments and assets and how much is being done to preserve and Look into the language issue. Thing. We have turned English to become like a pride value in our own cultural values. It's not cash transfer. It's not a COVID-19. Invasion 1897 was a deliberate Deliberate you know, many of these people coming to the urban areas now. These and applications, um, there are terms and conditions. That of course, mean, um, it is sense. the union of uh, two people, a man and a woman coming together. My name is Namdi Odipo. And I'm Elizabeth Omori. and stakeholders to proactively tackle these challenges. We know. Women in most countries of the world constitute about 50% of registered voters. Kevin Williams reporting for Deadline 360. In Jaws, Caleb Gochin, Deadline 360. Deadline 360. Shidi Okrafo. For Deadline 360. In Lagos, Michael Olaleye. Reporting for Deadline 360. I am Omosola Omojola. Thanks for tuning in. Nigeria has plenty of various renewable energy resources, of which solar, wind, biomass and small hydropower are the most abundant. Renewable Energy Roadmap for Nigeria was developed in collaboration with the Energy Commission of Nigeria and analyzes the additional renewable energy deployment potential up to the year 2050, with an additional 2030 focus to aid shorter-term policy development. Researchers insist short-term policies and lack of awareness as well as political instability are major barriers impeding the implementation of solar initiatives in Africa. How do we tackle these challenges for economic development? My guest, Nachibe, Senator Emechibe, a renewable energy expert, will speak to us. Uh, Senator, thank you so much for joining us on Insights. Yeah, thank you for having me. Well, Nigeria is a major exporter of fossil fuel, but faced with energy crisis. Now, Sustainable Development Goal 7 uh, actually aims to ensure access to affordable, reliable, and modern energy for all. How do we achieve this Sustainable Development Goal 7? Several factors uh, is limiting the experts and the companies from from delivering the desired results. Now let me take for instance, if you if you're working in Nigeria, there are so many factors you have to consider. Apart from designing a project and uh, doing your preliminary investigations and deploying a project, you have to consider the human factor. Um, I for one, most of our projects are in rural communities, underserved communities. And one of the biggest challenges we we'll face, apart from insecurity, is the human factor. And there's this ideology that everything is government, so everybody feels that whatever is coming to them, whether from the private sector or from any, anybody from government. So the mindset of the people needs to change, first of all, before they can actually harness this um, uh, renewable energy. because. So many people, so many companies have what it takes to deliver uh, 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 power to these remote and underserved communities. But we we'll meet a lot of challenges in the course of doing the work. And apart from the policies, the new policy, electricity uh, and policy is a good one, is a right step in the right direction. It will allow key players and investors to come in and actually generate power. So unlike 
before that you go through a very rigorous process uh, uh, before startups cannot actually venture into renewable energy generation but with these new policies startups can actually come and be among the players because i think individuals can actually generate up to a hundred kilowatt individuals or companies so with that i believe there are more players who come to the field and showcase what they can do uh, while we talk about quality of service because it's not just about generating power it's about sustainability and continuity so but when people start talking ppps and start looking for funding and investors you actually have to build situations that you have to build projects that actually work it will no longer be business as usual because when you talk about renewable energies it needs to be maintained it needs to be sustained it is a continuity you don't just go and build a mini grid and go away you have to have funding you have to have people in place to continue maintaining this grid set so i think government getting more involved in ppp public private partnership will actually go a very long way because most of the grids they build is practically free before. But if they can start building grids with a public-private partnership in the sense that you meet at these grids, the communities and the people who are using these grids actually pay a token to recharge, just like the, the distribution companies will have. That will give room for them to be able to manage and maintain those grids so that there will be a low failure rates because regardless of the fact that they are renewables there are so many factors that can actually affect this grid from from giving out the desired power there are dying times as a result of even a natural occurrences like thunder lightning and so on so i think uh, um, nigeria has what it takes to actually achieve um, uh, a lot of renewable energy bringing the renewable energy power into the the grid, as in, uh, I believe that futuristically Nigeria can have a smart grid where people can actually even sell the excess power they generate to the national grid. But all these things will take commitment from both uh, uh, the government and the uh, people, and having enabling laws that will allow these things to happen easily. Because one of the challenges we had before is that to set up a grid, you need to run a lot of uh, assessments and licenses. So you notice that in the field, you just have only the key players. So I believe if, um, if we we'll have a level playing ground for everybody to showcase what you can do, I believe that the renewable energy space will actually generate enough power to serve Nigeria as a whole, because we we'll have what it takes, we we'll have abundance of sunlight in this country. Okay. Yeah. Now, uh, let, before we talk about the challenges, biofuel has been identified as a sustainable form of renewable energy in Nigeria with the likes of uh, cassava, um, plant seed and waste materials, which could be used for bioethanol and biodiesel production. That brings the question to bear. Why haven't we been harnessing the potential in this area? A biofuel is a very good... Um renewable energy but the pro one of the problems we have in Nigeria is that we don't have enough food to go around before we can start diverting them to to generating electricity and insecurity is also one of the challenges why the food is not available in the first place <laughs> so you see all the problems we have in this country that are interconnected to each other a biofuel is a good one we have enough arable land to, if we can if Nigeria can invest so much in getting that um, sector of renewable energy rights, we'll do a lot of we'll do a lot of good from biofuel. So when you consider the cost of diverting those uh, uh, foods to generating biofuel, you see that it's it's not realistic right now. So we we'll have to have it in abundance for us to be able to exploit that um, aspect of renewable energy. Okay, uh, let's talk about the challenges this time around. Inadequate solar initiated research and lack of technological know-how are actually hampering usage of renewable energy in Africa. Why are we still lagging in these areas? Uh, when you talk about um, inadequacy, 
uh, Africa as a whole, we we have a lot of we have a lot of talented individuals in this country and in Africa as a whole, uh, but not having the not having the level playing field to exist is actually a big problem because so many people have the potential, so many companies have the potential to come in and play in the energy space. But when you're not given the room to participate in the energy space, it limits your potential from, you cannot contribute to the center. When you have, um, when you have um, policies or initiatives like this in place to 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 address these issues you see that so many players will come on board because if you go around this country have an opportunity to work in the whole geopolitical zones in this country you will realize that so many parts of this country for there are people that are places that don't know what it means to have a power uh, so when we talk about generating electricity uh, 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 it's as if this is just the center that's enjoying the the power that we're talking about right now. So what can be done? How can we use solar, for example, because we have so much heat in this part of the continent? Oh, yes. Um, rural electrification, it's, um, it's um, a very good one because solar, as you said, you don't need to, to set up your transformers and run from very long distances to bring power to the rural communities. If we can harness uh, deploying mini grids to rural communities, it will help a lot to, it's not just about providing electricity to the community, but both agricultural, uh, developmental, it will ease a lot for these um, remote rural communities. Uh, for example, you see some communities who, who are farmers who have foodstuffs. Their foodstuffs tend to spoil because there is no means of um, preserving them. When we, if we are able to deploy these um, solar grids to these communities, it will help a lot to, to develop the country as a whole because uh, so many communities have so much to offer to the center, to offer to the country, but because they don't have access to power, uh, it limits their potential. So we have a lot of sunlight in Nigeria and we are blessed with plenty of sunlight. Uh, if we can have um, more mini grids in communities, it will help a lot to to improve the livelihood of the people. In so many ways, the, the training, more and more people will get involved in installations, in learning about renewable energy. Um, I, I believe that um, uh, rural education agencies are doing their quota because if you go to several uh, geopolitical zones, you keep seeing the, there are many grids, uh, there are many grids there. So, so many communities are also opportune to be enjoying those solar installations right now. But so many, so many more are yet to, are yet to witness this. So we hope um, futuristically that we could achieve um, reaching more and more people with this solar power. With this solar power and by extension, we create more jobs for yeah. people. Now, uh, have you noticed that since the removal of fuel subsidy, many people are now using uh, the gas to power power generating sets for electricity. Should this initiative be embraced or nulled? Uh, gas is one of the renewables. Uh, um, so um, removing the subsidy, it's uh, a very big one. Uh, it took so many people on our way and uh, so many people, Nigerians are very good in looking for alternatives. So you notice that making use of gas to power your generators is quite cheaper compared to buying the, the fuel. Uh -huh. uh, so it's a good one, but provided um, the gas cylinder and the whole process is um, safe and secure, the, all the health, safety um, policies are adopted in developing 
um, such installations, I think is a good one it to reduce the cost. Uh, I think I, I, I was talking with someone the other day, he went to buy fuel from a, a small um, filling station and the filling station is actually using gas to power the generation, the generator they are using to sell the fuel. So mm -hmm. I think it's a good one in the long run, provided it's safe because uh, gas happens to be um, gas happens to be something you have to handle with extreme care. Extreme yeah. care. Now, talking about the SDG targets, uh, goal seven actually, do you see Africa meeting that goal before 2030? The new policy, the new electricity act, um, I believe will bring in more investors into the food, but there are plenty of lacuna in that act in the sense that when you say states can generate power and sell, they could set up their regulatory commissions. Um, all these things need to be streamlined. There are still so many questions that have not been answered in that act. So I believe the first uh, this government, this administration, this Tinubu administration, um, when it comes to economics, in my own point of view, I think the on the economic aspect, I think they're moving in the right direction. So we'll look at the implementation of this act and see where it takes us to. Um, I believe that if you give anything the time it needs and the energy it needs, that you will achieve the desired result. Uh, but for 2030, I, I prefer to be optimistic about it. So that happened to be a very expensive um, venture to, to venture into. But the sun is free. Yeah, but the sun is free. But the equipment needed to harness the sun and convert it into electricity. And when we talk about the equipment, one has to be very careful what you deploy and what you are using in the sense that you have to deploy what is standard to stand the test of time. And let me bring in the individual users of this solar. If you look around um, FCT as a whole right now, you notice that a lot of solar panels on roofs of houses. More people are becoming involved and are seeing uh, the need to to have solar as a backup instead of a generator. But in doing this, there are so many products out there and, and you have to be very careful to engage an energy expert or a trained um, technician or, or a company that actually know what they're doing. Because we're talking about power here and power is a very sensitive thing that shouldn't be handled lightly. So people who are actually trained and have what it takes to deploy this should be in the forefront of it. Our graduates, more and more people, more and more young men are looking into renewable energy space uh, because it's something that it's, it's not new, but it has become the in thing, especially with the removal of this full subsidy. So many people are looking towards it. I believe with the right training and the right guidance more people will have opportunities in the solar renewable energy space so how do we improve electrification in nigeria i think the, the best way we can improve on electrification in nigeria is by looking towards the renewable energies and having policies that that encourage more stakeholders into this space because uh, insecurity there's so many factors if we get it right with um, security uh, it will go a very long way in allowing people to freely invest and 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 build um, energy infrastructures another factor is the human factor in nigeria here is as if anything you bring to any community you are government. <laughs> so that mindset needs to change. Enlightenment and changing our mindset because these projects are meant to better the living standard. It's meant to better the life of the people. But when the people you are there to better their life are looking at you as, as somebody who government sent to them, it's also a problem. Uh, so I think uh, the mindset and the human factor is a very 
a big factor too that we need to consider when talking about getting it right, especially with the solar installations and renewable energy. Uh, my expectation is um, I expect the Tinubu led government with the removal of this subsidy to look to invest much into renewable energy, solar energy, mini grids, and try and bridge the gap. So by investing more into mini grids and renewable energy, I believe it will help in reducing the sufferings because um, if you don't have needs to go and buy fuel for your generator to run your small business, if you can have um, um, mini grids in your community and affordable, which is affordable, you can actually just recharge small, small and you're able to to do your daily work and get your daily bread from there. So I expect them to look inward into agriculture, making food availability, which they're already doing, they just declared a state of emergency. And I expect them to invest more into power, invest more into agriculture, and most importantly, security, because without security, we'll go nowhere in this country. All right, Nat Shepard, we want to thank you so much for your time. Thank you for enlightening us on Insight this week. Thank you very much. All right, thank you very much. I appreciate you for having me. Thank you. I'm fascinated with the discourse on national monuments and assets and how much is being done to preserve and Look into the language our issue. We have turned English to become like a pride value in our own cultural values. It's not cash transfer. Is not a COVID-19. Invasion 1897 was a deliberate, deliberate tactic. You know, many of these people coming to the urban areas now. These and applications, um, there are terms and conditions. That of course, mean, um, it is yes. the union of uh, two people, a man and a woman coming together. My name is Nam Diodipo. And I'm Elizabeth Omori. And that's Inside Today. Thank you for watching. I'm Elizabeth Amori. We'll see you next week. Bye for now.